course, we start our conversation around Jaden Stevenson, who is an, a fascinating tale given he once had the footy world at his feet. He was a pick six. You remember, he had a genetic heart issue, which came up in some medical testing. So Collingwood themselves only made the decision late to draft him. That was in 2017. But he would go on to be a rising star winner. 38 goals in his debut year. A grand final in his debut year. A very solid highlights reel. He was an exciting player. He kicked 21 goals in the first half of 2019. He was flying. Then came the betting scandal and then became the unravelling of a career that once promised so much. Yeah, it's hard to wrap your head around how this can happen for such a talented young player. And as I said, I thought he was a generational talent when I first saw him. You mentioned that that first season, but kicked five goals in his fourth game. He kicked two goals early in the 2018 grand final. Nothing seemed to phase him in terms of the big moments. He looked built to play for Collingwood in front of those big crowds. And they were captivated by what he was doing. To kick 38 goals as a small forward, and he was doing it differently. Like, he wasn't just your traditional crumbing small forward. He, his speed to burn, and he was electric. He was explosive. in your first, And he also was like, he laid three, three tackles a game in his first year. Like, 75 tackles in his first year. Never got anywhere near 70 tackles ever again for the rest of his career. Like, the most he ever had was 48 after that. So he was buying in defensively and he was a real weapon and he was a really difficult matchup who do you put on him is it more of a taller defender is it a small because they're gonna have to have speed he'd get out the back and, and get on you so and then it sort of unraveled from there so I mean the trade to North Melbourne uh, you, you question whether and how he was advised now he may have never made it he, he may have lost the motivation regardless, even if he had stayed at, at Collingwood. But you'd have to question the mistake to go to North, where since going there in 2021, he won three, one, two, two games um, and was clearly the whipping boy for frustrated North fans and coaches. Is he half back? Is he half forward? Is he dropped? Where is he? He needs to take ownership for that, clearly. Um, uh, and his lack of competitiveness at times, which he was. He, there was a genuine lack of competitiveness and toughness that there's different levels of toughness in football and some players are tougher than others, but there is a mm. requirement to put your body on the line when you need to, regardless of where you sit on that scale of toughness, and he wasn't prepared to do that, which leads us to the point where we find ourselves in now at 25. Sammy he walks away from a half a million dollar contract because he's lost the passion and, and love for the game. We'll get more details yeah, on that with that's, Mitch, but. that's Mitch's story. So nothing from North Melbourne officially at this stage, but um, Mitch's story is that uh, Jaden Stevenson has informed the club that he wishes to retire effective immediately. Just on the, like, who's to blame for what? Like, I saw something on um, Twitter last night that he was horribly mismanaged by two clubs, that his career was never going to last long after leaving Collingwood, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'd argue more with the former, and it, it's more on him than anything else, but we're not privy to all the details. Suffice to say... While some things conspired against him, he should serve as the cautionary tale for next month's draft crop. To all those kids getting drafted, you've got to want it. You've mm, got to mm. apply yourself. You've got to avoid temptation. You've got to devote yourself. It's it's professional sport for a reason. You're supposed to be professional. So we can talk about sliding doors and should he have chosen another club and being traded to Collingwood and whether he was the icing on the Collingwood cake and he was the icing at North Melbourne when there was no cake and whether it was a right fit. But really, at the end of the day, he has to have a good hard look at the decisions that he's made in his career. I mean, he bet on Collingwood games when he was there. He bet on himself while he was there. And now 2020, cop glandular fever. And then at the end of 2020, he was traded in contract as part of that Collingwood fire sale that also involved Adam Trelaw. So there's some things... That are, it's, it's hard to exactly pinpoint what is he's doing and what's come as a no result doubt. of his doing. No doubt. And he takes, he, in the end, if you're doing a, a sort of a pie graph of who's to blame, I mean, he's 80% on him, you would think. And then there's 20% that he's on the environment and other factors. But the bike accident in the, the off season yep. of 2021, which Fractured I Fractured his which hip, I which, which was oh. alarming. I was like, what, what, what are you doing? And when he was go, drunk, and he yeah. said that was the most pain he'd ever been in. Like yeah. a fractured hip's a serious injury. And hard, so to, what hard, to, come back, hard to come back from. So it, it, you're right. It's hard to remember a bigger waste of talent, unfortunately, because, as you said, we all were blown away by what he was able to do in that first season and the player that he looked like he was going to be. Like pro probably looked like he was going to kick 500 goals for, for his career. Um, and, and then it just uh, went off the rails from there. 
It's, it's a shame. A, but it, isn't, it, isn't it another reminder, though, that it just takes everything? everything like, yeah. You, you can have talent and you can have uh, you can have some have talent and no design and you have those with all the desire in the world and talent doesn't match. It's a reminder that at this forever unforgiving level, you need all ingredients to go into the rest. What would have happened to him? A big hypothetical if he had have gone to a strong club though so if he if he had have been traded to sydney what 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 player would he have been if he had have been traded to geelong and i i, I get i'm reluctant to to wheel out the same clubs every time but there's some there's other strong clubs and good environments what would what would his career have looked like if he had gone to a club with strong leaders around him to pull him into line with a strong culture that are that, that player game style that has you competitive and more suited to the opportunities that you get in a really difficult position as a small forward. I'm not sure he's retiring right now. So whilst oh, yes, what very whilst, hard to I say. I don't know. That. Whilst we he absolutely takes the blame and he's probably doing that right now and he's reflecting and when he's 45 and not 25 and he sits back, he goes, "Oh my goodness, you, you've you've heard Brendan Favola speak about and not." Not to the level of talent, you know, he's clearly not Brendan Favola. No, but you hear no. the regret when Brendan Favola speaks about this and where he could have been. He could have been, you know, 900, 950 goals, Fev, and an absolute hero. Um, but he got trapped in yeah. the and how well that. And how well supported, how many chances did he get at Carlton's? I mm. mean, he had a laundry list of chances and he would admit that. So... Look, off the text, Stevenson was overpaid at Collingwood coming off his rookie contract, which seemed to be the beginning of the end. Stopped working hard on his game and there were too many off-field distractions. And as good as those clubs are that you mentioned, they're, not, they're, not, they're no guarantee. Like players no, have no. gone to both of those clubs and still lost their way. Do you think this would have been the course of his career, though, if he had gone to one of those strong No, well, we can't, we can't answer no. that, can we? But, I mean, clearly the signs were there before he'd left Collingwood, weren't they? Yeah, oh, but there's signs there with Stevie Johnson as well. Like... Yep. So, so there's, well, some there's, take the wake up call, and maybe some 100%, don't. A lot, a lot of, a lot of players take the wake up call. A lot of them, and some, some take four years, some take six, some never get it. Like Jordan Degoe, I don't think he's ever going to get it, and I don't think he cares. And I don't think, whilst he's had some great moments, Jordan Degoe is a moments player. He hasn't had a career that you're going to look back on and go, oh, he's a Collingwood Hall of Famer. He's not when he absolutely could have been. Now, he'll say, well, I won a premiership and my prelim yeah. final was unbelievable. And if it wasn't for me, we'll get... And you can justify your career like that. But when Jordan Degoe is 45 years of age, what what is his reflection of his career going to be? Is it going to be the same as Fev a little bit or, or not? Or does he care? So that there's, well, there's always it's, players that take... He's got a headline moment, though, Jordan Degoe, that Brendan Favola doesn't have. Yeah. I mean, well, he, he's won a premiership and, and played a massive part in winning that premiership. So I would say, is his ceiling higher? Absolutely. But he still has a headline moment at the end of the day. But he it was to end the now. surface of what his yeah, career we could can have. say that. He, he, yeah. Well, I can absolutely say that. Yeah. Of what he was capable of. So my point is that some players just never get it now. Jordan Degoe, you're right. He's going to have a career that goes 15 years and he's going to earn a lot of money. He's got a premiership. So it's not disastrous by any means at all. And the Collingwood people love him. Whereas Stevenson's not going to ever have that. I just feel sad, really. I just, I just yeah. feel sad with all the education that young players now get. And we interview them all the time. You go, these 18-year-olds are so set up for success. They couldn't be any better prepared and most of them will absolutely get the best out of themselves. But even with all of that and the education and the lectures on the pitfalls of, you know, gambling and, and all of that, drugs, alcohol, all, all of that that they get, some um, don't get it. And I mean, you do need to have that intrinsic competitiveness in you that wants to get the best out of yourself. And mm. Stevenson never had that. Lee, off the text, turn it up. Corn, you need to put your body on the line. The biggest squib in the history of the what game. Just said that. I would said, he get a hard ball at Sydney or Geelong? Well, 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 he, well he would because you, you train it and your senior teammates around you don't let you get away with efforts that aren't in line with the team. No one was saying he was squibbing it when he kicked 38 goals and kicked yep. two goals in the first quarter of so, the grand final. I'm sort of a believer that, right, okay, would he, would he ever be a wrecking ball player? No, absolutely not. But it takes all types. So in the right environment, and you're right, he, there's some non-negotiables. When it's his turn, he's got to go. But you don't have to be an absolute sledgehammer out there to influence a game. And he was absolutely doing that. Dan's asking, would anyone pick up a refreshed Jaden Stevenson in 2026? Well, Dan, 
Mitch's story, if it is to be correct, and there's no reason to suggest that it isn't, is that he's just lost the passion. So I'm not sure Jaden Stevenson at this stage is going to give clubs anything to think about in, uh, in 12 or 24 months' time um, at the moment. Uh, Jake Stringer's only scratched the surface in his career, says Jake. Yep. And, and history is littered with players like this. Some have just uh, cruised on through, some have seen the light, and some have gone the same direction as Jaden Stevenson. How bad's their recruiting been north? Like, how many of these types of players have they tipped themselves into and not been able to get the best out of it? Like, how many of their recruits have actually gone to north and been better players? You're going to go down the Pollock and well, all of them. Pittard D- and Dylan Stevens, Stevenson. Fisher, like, mm. uh, Logue, Core, like, they're absolutely everywhere. Like... So just because players are available, North has been the, the, the hunting ground that they've, they've landed at because they get a big check to go there, but there hasn't ever really resulted in performance. I'm, I'm happy to take your texts on, on those that they've had success with that haven't been drafted, but there's not many. There's not many in recent times, and a lot of them have been paid hefty contracts, long-term contracts mm-hmm. to go there. And there's just been that their list management has just been disastrous. Now they would say, well, what what other option do we have? We've tried to get these players, and no one wanted to come. So that that's where you land with your Dylan Stevens, Pittard, Polak types. But gee whiz, it's been it's been ugly for the last ten years with their list management at North. And here's another example of that. Yeah, but they've nailed some recent draft picks. So well, you'd want it, it would though, appear, when you got it would appear, when you got multiple well, picks in the okay, top five. But they have. Seven, but they have. To, yeah, yeah, you'd want to, but they have. So yeah. the future does look promising on that front. So Jaden Stevenson, it was a, it was a ten match suspension for for betting on Collingwood games and on his own performance in the end. So we talk about twenty eighteen, but halfway through twenty nineteen, he kicked twenty one goals. So he's on track for a forty plus goal season, which Amazing. would have been a, new, a high watermark for him. So he was flying. Um, as it sits, he's going to retire. So one hundred and twenty two games, seven seasons. He was contracted for one more. What happens somewhere there, around do you think? somewhere around half a million dollars? Well, this is a question for Mitch, but these things are open to negotiation. So there will be a settlement of some sort. And obviously it opens up uh, another list spot for North Melbourne to fill, given that he's done it now, which the Kangaroos would be thankful for. The sub rule uh, would appear to be staying, according to reports in the Herald Sun yesterday. Anyway, the lobbying from the players and the coaches has uh, never been stronger, as we said before the break, Kane, to have it banished. Go to five on the bench, yet it would appear the AFL is holding in the AFL's view, officially has always been that uh, 75 rotations, four and a sub allows for the, I guess, the fairest scenario. And also, obviously, the capacity to replace an injured player with a fresh teammate. Now, it only became uh, a tactical sub uh, in 2023. It was a medical one before that. That medical sub was introduced right on the eve of the 2021 season. You'll remember just a couple of days before when the uh, concussion um, uh, mandatory time out of the game was was doubled to 12 days. That's why that came in. Now it's tactical, and now the players and the coaches and everyone seemingly is completely over it. Yeah, they are. Now, I, I don't understand it. We, we had the sub at one stage in the sort of 2011, 2012 sort of region, and everyone hated yep. it. That and was the post-it note I era. I just thought that it would never, ever happen again. Now, they sort of disguise this as an, an injury sub, which when, as you said, when it was brought in, but it's not an injury sub. It's just a pure sub, which was the exact same format that it was when everyone hated it earlier on in the 2000s. Yep. So they've brought it back in the exact same format. Everyone hates being named the sub. The coaches hate naming a sub. There's confusion when the teams are named around who is going to be the sub and who is not. The amount of time we spend on a player that is that inconsequential to the result of a game is unbelievable. How many times has a sub actually been the difference in a game? Maybe five, six times for the whole year. Look, 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 Luke Bruce has been some examples of uh, Braden Campbell, uh, really impactful, Like, but not, not very often is the sub the difference of the result in a game. So my, my preference is to always make it four. Why would we even change it? Four mm. on the bench. Well, well, you might get an injury. Early. Yeah, but that'll even out. Like, And some of the best and gutsiest and grittiest wins come from teams that have been down a player early and they found a way to win. I would have kept it at four. If you're not going to keep it at four, you just make it five. Now, you keep the rotation cap at 75, and then it's up to the coaches to yeah. work out how they use that 75. Is it an extra Ruckman? Does he play less time? That's I'd- the thing. Would extra big men be 
utilised? Would we get more second rucks in the game? Maybe. I mean, that's the argument in some courts. Would help, wouldn't it? Like, would, would it would help them. And you might only bring on the fifth player in the second half. Like, it opens up all sorts of uh, Brings tactical back coaching. questions. It, yeah. I think we're, we stifle coaching so much in our game. Like, the... The starting position that it stifles coaching. The stand stifles coaching. There's so many things that stifle coaching. This is another one. The sub, like, and you say, well, it's tactical when you want to use a sub. Do you go early? Well, it's not really. You just play five if that's the way you want to go and get rid of it. Because as you say, there's not any supporters other than those at <laughs> AFL House. I've asked Josh Money about this. Are you getting rid of the sub? Uh. Yeah, but, well, they, they, they never confirm it. But I would have thought for all money, they would have scrapped this. So just about every coach is, I mean, I've lost count of how many coaches are criticised, but when this news dropped yesterday in the Herald Sun, I was immediately taken back to AFL 360. I think it was in April. Brad Scott was on. It was coaches night. Sam Mitchell was with him and they got onto the subject of abolishing the sub. This is Brad Scott and Sam Mitchell going back a few months. I would prefer five on the bench. I, I don't think there's a player in the competition that enjoys the sub rule, either being the sub or being subbed off. The best point that Brad Scott made, I'm not sure if it was on that night, I think it was in a post-match press conference, is that the sub rule actually is counterproductive in the sense it puts more pressure on club doctors Mm. and medicos to make a call on a concussed player because they know that they've got to make a quick decision to get the sub on. Now, he had an incident with Harry Jones earlier this year where it was 16 minutes to go in the last quarter. They had to assess him, so they said, look, we've just got to sub him because we don't have time to wait. So if you had five on the bench... You could put someone on in Harry Jones's place and then Harry could come back on if he didn't have concussion. But instead he's saying this actually puts more pressure on the doctors to make quick decisions no doubt. under pressure that's 100%, not needed. 100%. And you need all those eyes on the field of play as well. Whilst doctors are distracted trying to work out whether you've got to sub him and have look at the vision as he's been concussed, do the concussion test, all of that, they're missing everything else that's on the field as well. And the counter one to that is Holmes in the prelim for Geelong. They, they don't want to sub him. Because as soon as you sub him, he's gone. But then, yep. so, so they make 20 minutes or what the exact time frame around about, is he going to go back on? Yep, we're going to put him back on. Whereas so they play he, a man down in that time? Yeah, they play a man mm. down for 18 minutes whilst they're, because he's such an important player for them. If it was a lesser player, you'd just sub him out straight away. But if you've got five on the bench, okay, well, you just put, you've got the other four to take care of the rotations. You get the, the treatment that Holmes needs and you've got, a little bit more information before you rush him back or before you have to actually sub him out. It, yeah, it, it. I'm not sure. I just don't know what they're doing. I, they, they've mm. made some really interesting decisions at AFL House this year, and I think there is starting to become a real divide, maybe more so than I've seen in a while, between those running the game uh, and the average fan. Yeah, it's, it's hard to know unless you're in, involved in all of them, and uh, some clubs take it. Well, not more seriously, but they just have different structures around the way that they set up their development programs. I mean, it's hard to, we always speak about Geelong and just how seriously they take it and their ability to maximise players that haven't been high draft picks. So I always look to that, but I mean, everyone's taking it seriously, aren't they? Oh, of Sammy. course they are. Like, There's well, whole it, teams it, devoted to player development. Is, but it's always the question, is, is it the talent? Is it the development? Yeah. Well, the answer's both. It's the classic chicken or the egg footy conversation. Is it the players that clubs bring in or is it what they do with them after they get there? So the classic thing was, you know, when Scully and Trengove arrived at Melbourne all those years ago and were made, um, you know, Trengove was part of the captaincy and it was ridiculous, was, you know, if they had gone to another club, what sort of careers would they have had? And it's the impossible question Mm. to answer. They the best players go to the worst clubs, typically speaking. That's the nature of the draft. So they're thrown in the deep end to some degree. But, um, geez, it, it, depending on where you end up can make a massive difference in a career, I reckon. Well, massive, well, massive well, difference. Well, it can. And, and those that surround you as well. And uh, North fans will hate this again, but Horn Francis's performance at Port Adelaide versus his first year at North, like it's, it's chalk and cheese because... Yep, he's got his flaws still, but he's surrounded by more senior players. They have better um, success on the field. It's easier to play better in a winning side. And that's that's another example of that. What would his career look like if he went and stayed there versus getting out, which was 
clearly. But he's a bit different, though, isn't he? Because was he ever going to stay? He might not have ever been going to stay there. They might have won ten games, and he still wanted to come back. Don't know. Like I mean, don't know. You don't but know. But would he have been the? Would he have been second in the best and fairest in his third year at North Melbourne and in the All Australian squad if he stayed at North Melbourne? That's, that's mm. and, and the player that he's now looking to be. These are unanswerable questions, I know, but I think we've got a pretty good idea of what the answer would be.